Space-time tells matter how to move, and matter tells space-time how to curve. This is a quote that captures the essence of general relativity and summarizes the interplay between matter and curvature of space-time. In this video, I'm going to try to unpack at least a little bit the mathematics that hide behind this and hopefully build some visual intuition for what's going on. Let's start with the distribution of matter and energy in space. This equation is then going to tell us how this distribution of matter is going to curve space-time. This is a set of partial differential equations that are called the Einstein field equations. The right-hand side describes the distribution of matter and energy, and the left-hand side the curvature of space-time. So, for a given distribution of matter and energy, these equations enable us to calculate the curvature of space-time. Then, Having calculated the curvature of space-time, the matter and energy content within that curved space-time manifold is going to move. And this movement is described by the following equation, which is called the geodesic equation. After a bit of time, we will then have a new distribution of matter, which means that we have to start from the beginning again. The goal of this video is to explain the second part, the geodesic equation, first in a visual and hopefully intuitive way before actually going into the mathematics. According to Einstein, gravity is not a force. Instead, particles follow straight paths, so-called geodesics. These trajectories are only non-trivial due to the curvature of the underlying space-time manifold. To begin, we're only going to focus on geodesics in curved space rather than curved space-time. We will add time later after going through the basics of special relativity in later videos, because these basics are necessary to understand curved space-time. The neat thing is, that the mathematics that we're going to develop here apply entirely to the case of a curved space-time manifold. We will start with the easiest and almost trivial case of a two-dimensional Euclidean manifold, so no curvature at the start. Now, a particle that follows a geodesic is shown on screen, but what exactly makes it a geodesic? To get to our definition, we will add the velocity vector, which points into the direction of travel. Now, we'll save the velocity vector at two close-by points in time. If we zoom in and move the second vector to the first one, we see that they are exactly the same. The velocity vector stays the same if we follow a straight path. Let's go back to the beginning and look at a different trajectory. This one is, quite trivially, not straight. If we do the same thing as we did before, we keep the velocity vector at two very close-by points in time and compare them, see that now they're indeed not the same. You probably noticed that essentially what we're doing here is we're taking a derivative. We are comparing the velocity at some time t with the velocity at time t plus delta t. In the animation, the time distance delta t is of course not infinitesimal, because we wouldn't be able to see anything. For the straight path, this derivative was zero, whereas for a not straight path, it ended up being not zero, meaning that the particle was accelerated. So we might as well also show the acceleration vector, which in this case points radially towards the center of the circle that the particle follows. In this last example, the particle traces out a straight line. However, it does accelerate, which is why it does not fall under the category of a geodesic. Now, we're going to attempt to generalize what we just discussed for the two-dimensional Euclidean space to a two-dimensional curved surface. As an example, we are discussing geodesics on a sphere. The same arguments would, however, hold true for any curved manifold. To start, we will consider a trajectory that follows a line of constant latitude. Again, we will keep track of the velocity vector such as we can follow the same steps as before to determine whether this is a geodesic or not. We will again draw the velocity vector at two close-by points in time and compare them. So essentially take the derivative to compute the acceleration. When zooming in, we can now see that the curvature of the sphere might change things a bit. But for now, let's just blindly apply the same recipe as before. So, we again move the second velocity vector to the first and compute the difference, which is the red little arrow. We will move it to the point where we've taken the derivative and also increase its size a bit, such that we can actually see something. Earlier, we said that if the derivative of the velocity is non-zero, there is an acceleration. That might make you think that this is also not a geodesic. However, we have not yet taken into account the curvature of the manifold. In order to see how this plays a role, imagine that you're a two-dimensional being that lives in this two-dimensional curved surface. 
The idea is that if you were to measure how the velocity changes over time, that is, you want to measure the red vector, only part of it is actually accessible to you and has a physical meaning in the manifold itself. And that is the part that is in the tangent space of that point of that manifold. So what is a tangent space? Here I've drawn two vectors that are within the tangent space of that point. You can see that they are, well, tangential to the manifold. These are vectors that do have a physical meaning in the manifold itself and could be measured in the manifold. They could, for example, represent the electric field or the velocity as we've already seen. Now, the tangent space is a collection of all vectors that are tangential to the manifold at a certain point. So, this one is also part of the tangent space, this one is also part of the tangent space, and so on. We can make the representation of the tangent space in our animation a bit more abstract by showing this grid, where every vector of the tangent space has its tip somewhere on this plane. Going back to our difference quotient, we see that it is not in the tangent space. However, we can split it up into a part that is in the tangent space and a part that is orthogonal to the tangent space. Again, if you were some two-dimensional being that lives within the curved sphere, only the greenish part of the vector would be accessible to you. The purple one simply lies within an extra dimension that you do not have any access to. To generalize our definition of a geodesic, we therefore say that the part of the difference quotient that is within the tangent space must be zero. The part that is orthogonal to the tangent space does not have any physical meaning within the curved manifold itself, so it could also be not zero. Basically what we just showed is a very detailed way of calculating a derivative. So we might as well just draw the derivative of the velocity, which is the acceleration. So this time we are showing the same trajectory as before, but the acceleration vector is also drawn. Let's look more closely at the acceleration vector at one point in time, and let's also increase its size a little bit. Again, we see that the acceleration vector does not live within the tangent space. However, it has a part that does live within the tangent space. So we split the acceleration vector up into two components and see that the part in the tangent space is not zero, which means that this is an accelerated curve and not a geodesic. So to illustrate what this means one last time, if you were a two-dimensional being and you wanted to drive your car on this line of constant latitude, you would have to constantly steer a bit to the left, so it would have to accelerate. By now, you might already be able to guess that there is in fact one line of constant latitude where you would not have to steer in any direction, and that is the equator. So let's see how this plays out and why the equator is in fact a geodesic. So we're again drawing the velocity vector and the acceleration vector. We do see that the acceleration vector is not zero. But, as we discussed earlier, we need to see whether there is a non-zero projection onto the tangent space of the acceleration vector. If we again show the tangent space, we're able to see that the acceleration vector is entirely orthogonal to it. As only the projection on the tangent space has a physical meaning for some two-dimensional being in the manifold, we conclude that the equator must be a geodesic. So, if you were to put an object on the equator and you give it some initial kick, some initial velocity along the equator, and then you just let go of it entirely, that is, not accelerate it any further, it would move along the equator. Now, the equator is just one example of a geodesic on a sphere. In general, geodesics on a sphere are called great circles, and I'm showing another example of such a great circle on screen. The geodesic that is followed is determined by the initial position and velocity. Ultimately, what we want to find is an equation, a mathematical expression that gives us the geodesic for a given curved manifold and some initial conditions. So next, we're going to try to turn the intuition for geodesics that we just obtained into a mathematical framework. First, let's take the derivative of some vector field that we'll call capital V which will later be the velocity. We're taking the derivative with respect to some coordinate that is denoted x beta. In order to do calculations, we always have to equip our manifold with a set of coordinates. 
Now, the choice of coordinates is entirely up to you. However, usually there is a natural way of choosing these coordinates. In our example, we're looking at a sphere. A natural way to describe that sphere would be polar coordinates, where we are using the two angles theta and phi to describe every point on the manifold. So x with index 1 is theta and x superscript 2 is phi. But, and this is an important thing to stress, the physics that you'll get out at the end, the geodesic, does not depend on the choice of coordinates. Keeping in mind what we showed earlier, we want to split this derivative up into two components. One that is tangential to the manifold and one that is orthogonal or normal to the manifold. We will start by expressing the vector in a basis. A natural way of doing this is to choose the vectors that are tangential to the coordinate lines as basis vectors. I have already shown this without explicitly mentioning it when we were first talking about tangent spaces. The two blue vectors are tangential to the coordinate lines and can be chosen as basis vectors. Every vector in the tangent space can be expressed as a superposition of these basis vectors. This one, for example, is 0.9e1 plus 0.9e2. And this one is minus e1. So with the choice of the coordinate system for our manifold, we can express every vector as a linear combination of these basis vectors. Also, we're using the Einstein summation convention, which means that we will always sum over an index that appears two times in an expression. So this notation v alpha times e alpha means that we are summing over all possible values for alpha. In the example that we discussed, we have two coordinates, theta and phi. Therefore, we get v1 times the first basis vector plus v2 times the second basis vector. Next, we're simply using the chain rule to get these two expressions. When examining these two expressions, we see that the first one is definitely going to be tangential to the manifold because it is already expressed as a linear combination of the basis vectors. For the second expression, we have this derivative of the basis vector. This derivative is again a vector. However, we cannot say for sure that it will be tangential to the manifold. Therefore, we can again split it up into a part that is tangential to the manifold and a part that is normal to the manifold. For the part tangential to the manifold, we know for sure it can be expressed as a linear combination of the basis vectors, where we denoted the components by gamma. Again, using Einstein's summation convention, we sum over all mu. Note that these components also depend on alpha, which gives us the basis vector that we're looking at, and beta, which tells us the coordinate that we're differentiating to. These components do not depend on the physical problem that we're looking at, but instead only on the manifold and the coordinate system that we chose. Therefore, they are quite universal and important, which means they get a name, the Christoffel symbols. For now, it is not super important how to calculate them, so we'll just omit that part for now. With that, let's go back to the previous equation that we had. As an intermediate step, we can change the first index from alpha to mu. This is possible because we're summing over all of them anyways, so you could literally name it anything. All that's left to do now is to plug in the expression that we got, including the Christoffel symbols, and factor out the e mu, which is why we just changed the index from alpha to mu. If we do that and reorganize everything a bit, we arrive at this expression. This is precisely what we wanted, because now we have one part that is tangential to the manifold, and another part that is orthogonal to the manifold. As we discussed earlier, really just the part that is tangential to the manifold is of significance to us. Therefore, we can define a new way of differentiating, where the part that is orthogonal to the manifold is simply omitted. That derivative is denoted as such with the nabla symbol. This derivative is quite important for curved manifolds, and it is called the covariant derivative. Now, from this point, it's not too difficult to derive the geodesic equation. What we want to do is find a trajectory on the manifold, which means we want to find a parameterization x of lambda. Here, lambda is the variable that takes us along the trajectory. 
The constraint that we discussed for a geodesic is that the component of the acceleration that lies in the tangent space must be zero. As we're just interested in the component in the tangent space, we can use the covariant derivative, as discussed earlier, and set it to zero. Here, the vector u is the velocity, which is convention in relativity. The velocity can also be expressed as a linear combination of the basis vectors with these components. You might be a bit confused to see lambda and not the time t here. For now, you could also just substitute it by the time t to get the usual definition of the velocity. However, ultimately in general relativity, time is also part of the manifold and not absolute, so we cannot easily use it to parameterize a trajectory through space. So let's go through the last couple of steps to get to the geodesic equation. First, we're going to use the chain rule, which is equally applicable to the covariant derivative. So we get the covariant derivative with respect to the coordinate x beta, and then we still need to differentiate the coordinate x beta with respect to the variable lambda. Note again that we're still using Einstein's summation convention to sum over all beta. Now, we can simply plug in the equation for the covariant derivative that we derived earlier to a right expression. Plugging in the definition for the velocity and rearranging a bit, we arrive at the final result. This is the geodesic equation. It is a second order differential equation that gives you the trajectory for non-accelerating objects. As it is second order, you need an initial position and also an initial velocity to specify the geodesic. There are also different ways to derive this equation. One of them is to minimize the distance between two points on a manifold, which is also why planes fly along geodesics. If you understood everything up to this point, you should have a pretty good intuition about what geodesics actually are. However, from what we have discussed so far, it is not entirely obvious what geodesics in spacetime are, and how the curvature of spacetime leads to planetary orbits or the bending of light. So, for the next videos, the plan is to first go over the fundamentals of special relativity before going back to general relativity to address the already mentioned topics, because there are a lot of beautiful concepts there to understand.